Hello and welcome back to Locana Villain. My name is Baker and today is my first scripted video of the season. I did a couple of these last season for a couple of decks that I felt that I, like I had somewhat mastered. Um, I wanted to be able to go through in a far deeper analysis. Really, this video is going to be most ideal for people that are either complete beginners or are at least less experienced with Lorcana and the control archetype. I talk about my current build of Ruby Amethyst Control. I'll go into a lot of detail about every card's purpose, my justifications for them, um, but also a little bit about the history of the deck in its previous formats, how it's developed, why, um, alternative options, thoughts on the mulligan, and early lines of play, and basically a little bit of everything to help people really get caught up with the deck. As such, a lot of this information may be less informative to more experienced players, but I've spent a lot of time trying to make the whole thing a lot more visually interesting with some bad jokes. And if you're anything like me, you just like hearing people talk about Lorcana. So even if you're an advanced player, hopefully it'll be something that you'll enjoy. Because the guide section ended up taking so long, 40 minutes to be exact, I've only included one actual match at the end. Um, but if the matches are more what you're interested in, don't worry, I've put a bunch of I've got a bunch of others ready to go. Um, I'll upload them as their own separate video doing commentary for them all. That being said, there's a lot to discuss, so let's take a look at control. And if you're looking for some singles from Into the Inklands, then check out Card Market for all your trading card game needs. Ruby Amethyst Control has been one of, if not the best deck in Lorcana since the game released. Admittedly, that's only been two three-month formats, but the power level of the red and purple deck with all the draw and all the removal has been undeniable throughout competitive play so far. With the deck taking the vast majority of top cut spots at various tournaments since the game released. As we move into set 3, some ink colours have gained a lot of powerful support to help them compete, and I do believe that the chokehold that RA Control has had on the Lorcana meta is set to be loosened slightly, with more ink combinations looking far more capable of standing up to the control powerhouses. Tournament results so far have shown far more diversity than perhaps we've ever seen in the meta game. But Control is still filling a lot of the top cut spots and looking better than ever with the new set of tools made available to it by Into the Inklands. I've been a Control main since my first day of playing the game, partly because it always seemed to bear the closest resemblance to a villain deck with the amount of Disney antagonists that it features. But also, it just feels good to be able to draw a lot of cards and have a lot of answers to opposing threats. Playtesting Control in set 3, it's feeling better than ever, continuing to utilise previous tools from sets 1 and 2, as well as incorporating new toys from set 3, including the new location card type. I've played around with a few builds so far, and this is the variant that currently feels the most consistent. If my previous experience is anything to go by, some of my opinions here could easily change, plus the natural progression of the format and which other decks are doing well may force changes just to be able to answer the metagame. Ruby Amethyst's main strength has always typically lied in its mid to late game. Prior formats have usually seen the deck run a high count of expensive powerhouses, a lot of which being uninkable, with pilots using their opening turns to draw as many cards as they can while not letting the opponent run away with the board state, dragging the game into its later stages where those key cards come online and the deck can begin to dominate. Set 2 builds still had a large emphasis on expensive characters, but gained new mid-range tools which gave the deck cheaper removal on a body and the ability to reach higher numbers with low-cost characters, which were often significant enough to deal with the opposing meta threats. Plus the addition of quick lore gain cards like Merlin Goats, the Sorceress Spellbook, and cheap evasive questers like Minnie Mouse meant that we had other ways of actually winning the game that didn't rely on big bodies to aggressively quest for lore. Therefore, some control builds began to move away from some of the more expensive options, opting for a heavier mid-range. The evolution of control going into set 3 is not as significant as the jump from sets 1 to 2. The early to mid-range Amethyst package looks largely the same, while mostly cutting a couple of its bigger bodies. But the Ruby cards include some new spice and a slight adaption of the Lady in Red. 
The most significant addition to the deck is the new location cards. Ruby and Amethyst have well-earned reputations for getting a lot of the best cards, and they didn't break that pattern when it came to our first set of locations, with both inks getting some pretty great ones, along with Ruby getting without a doubt the best character to synergize with them. Locations do a lot to speed up the format even more, helping RA to continue to allow its mid-range cards to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to actually gaining lore, while still having access to some of the best removal options in the game. Now let's talk about my current build, what purpose every card fills, and why I've made some of the choices that I have. Then we'll evaluate some other considerations that you might want to try. If you're new to Lorcana, something you will likely end up hearing about a lot is the curve. The curve refers to using each turn to play a card which fully utilises your available ink count. On turn 1 we want to play a 1 drop, turn 2 a 2 drop, etc. Failing to do this against an opponent who does play their curve can often result in your opponent running away with lore and the board state as they outvalue your plays. Therefore we usually want to make sure we are playing a card or cards every turn that fully utilises our ink pool and make sure that we can always have on board characters that can check our opponent's plays. There are moments where you may not do this, especially later in the game if you need to preserve resources and play around opposing board clear, but by and large the first few turns of the game we want to curve out the best we can, while allowing room to adapt if the board state calls for it. For one drops we are playing 3 Olaf and 4 of the new Rafiki. Set 2 brought some strong low cost cards to the game which caused 2 ping damage to opposing characters. Therefore, RA control decks began using characters with a 1-3 stat line as their 1-drop to make sure they weren't always so easily removed. This was important as the 1-drop acts not only as an early check to opposing aggro characters, but sets us up for our bounce-related cards from turns 2 and 3, which we will get to. But setting up for these bounce cards is important, so we still want that stat line open to us to ensure that our 1-drop survives, especially when facing steel decks. But Rafiki being a 1-drop who can hit for 3 is too good for us to pass up in the current meta. Steel's Captain Hook has been a staple of most Steel decks since set 1 because 3 is a very significant number to hit in the early to mid game. It will check a lot of characters in the first few turns. Plus, locations are really good, so having more characters, especially cheap ones, that can hit bigger numbers is important. Oh, and they might fancy dropping by the Queen's Castle. These 7 1 drops have so far felt enough that more often than not I am seeing one in my opening hand post mulligan and able to turn our bounce cards online. For 2 drops, firstly, Kuzco. Having 2 drops besides Snake is good, as it gives us more options to help ensure we get a character on board before our turn 3, which we often want so that we have access to Madame Mim Fox, who can single handedly level a board state. Kuzco serves this purpose while offering a slow card draw. Slow meaning he usually won't provide the draw the turn he's played, unless you play cards like Teeth and Ambitions. But just knowing that that extra card is coming once he is banished is great. His stat line might not be too much to celebrate, but he is another cheap body that can quest without losing us card count. And he can hang out at the Queen's Castle. and he can help us push a little more into opposing board clears without being quite so punished. Next we have our first uninkable, Pinocchio. Any uninkable card we play really does need to be that good or and serve an important enough purpose to warrant its inclusion. Exerting opposing characters in itself is a great ability and one we would love to utilise so that our hard hitters can quickly utilise threats. Floodborne Elsa can do this and more, which made her a staple of the first two formats, but obviously she is expensive. Chapter 1 also gave us a much cheaper 3 cost Elsa, who could provide the exert ability, but had to wait a full turn before doing so. That one whole turn, unfortunately, often made her far too slow, meaning she saw little play in set 1 format, and zero play in competitive events for set 2, despite the fact that most people were playing a Floodborne Elsa who could use this as a shift target. 
Pinocchio's ability to exert as he comes into play, and being a very reasonable two cost, is much better. And he did see some play in set two format, allowing for a quick response when staring down common and powerful turn three threats, such as Doc, Ariel and Arthur, shutting them down before they get the chance to be fully utilised. However, uninkable slots are very competitive in this deck, so while Pinocchio saw some play, he was far from being a staple for the control decks. Set 3 brings with it new powerful turn 3 threats, the most notable of which being Ursula, Deceiver of All. This emerald powerhouse is without a doubt one of the best new cards in the game. The amount of value that can be generated off of this sea witch if she survives long enough to sing something can be game changing. This alone might be more than enough reason for RA decks to start including the talkative puppet. Plus, this being a come into play ability means that we can potentially recycle it using our bounce mechanics. That's a perfect point for us to come to our final two drop, and the first of these bouncers, Madame Mim Snake. Bounce was a mechanic added to the game with set two, with characters based on Madame Mim who require another character to be returned to the player's hand in order to keep them on the field. We also got a bunch of new Merlin based cards who all triggered an ability when entering and leaving play. Obviously, this was a match made in heaven, with the Madame Mim's cost to play them actually providing a powerful synergy, not only with these Merlin cards, but allowing us to reuse the powerful come into play abilities possessed by the MVP characters the deck was already playing. Madame Mim Snake is the first of our bouncers, with her 3 3 stat line providing a good check to a lot of opposing early characters, while keeping her out of range of the pre mentioned common songs that deal 2 damage. In many situations, she is our preferred turn 3 play, letting us hold off the board while we ink up to more powerful cards that will enable us to go more on the offensive. Plus, she is a more reliable line when you're on the draw, facing down Ursula, Deceiver of All, as you want a character that can hit for 3 already on the board the turn they play Ursula, so that you can use your turn 3 to play Pinocchio and immediately remove her. Rafiki can hit for the 3 we need to achieve this, which is another reason he's a good addition to the deck, but when facing Steel, they are far more likely to be able to play an action dealing the 2 damage needed to remove him before he can challenge. So against those decks, Snake is likely your preference. Moving on to our 3 drops, it makes sense to start with our other bouncer, Madame Mim Fox, easily one of Amethyst's best cards. The bounce cost, as we have established, is anything from easily attainable to high highly beneficial, and hitting for 4 on a 3 cost character with Rush is simply stupid at times. And I'd love to meet whoever looked at this concept in the design phase and said, oh yeah, this can be inkable. They sound fun. Fox is one of our best early options to control the board. 4 strength is enough to deal with a great deal of early threats, and anyone facing Amethyst should always exert with caution when going into the opponent's turn 3. The rush ability is also more important than ever due to big bulky locations that need to be removed as soon as possible, and 4 is a good contribution to the maths needed to do so. Next, the first of our Merlin cards who benefits from entering and leaving play, we have Merlin Crab. Crab was a popular inclusion in control decks since set 2 for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as the deck would often run 6 to 8 one drops with a 1 3 stat line, you could miss the fox by turn 3, but still achieve the same stat line by dropping a crab and turning your snowman or your classy mouse into a 4 3 beat stick, with the 3 willpower meaning you would often survive the challenge and stick around the board. It was also just good to be able to boost yourself to hit bigger numbers in the mid to late game, as Steel and Sapphire decks gained access to the resist keyword, with Cinderella stout hearted and Cogsworth being particularly hard to overcome through challenges. Plus, in the mirror match, you were likely facing down a number of Ursulas, with the 2-8 stat line being incredibly hard to break through. Yes, as a control deck we usually had access to hard removal for these threats, but some control decks were playing far less targeted removal and leaning more into cards like Lady Tremaine, who could be played around. So having more options to be able to just hit bigger numbers and remove threats through challenges was appreciated. Perhaps the most specific useful interaction for Merlin Crab has been working with Stylish Surfer Mini to destroy Stylish Surfer Mini. 
Mini was a dominating force in set 2 control decks. The 3 willpower keeps her out of range of a lot of the ping cards we have mentioned. Questing for 2 is really good, and having evasive allowed her to just sit there and generate so much lore before your opponent was forced to use more expensive cards just to remove her. Because basically no decks were playing evasives, especially the mirror. This did eventually evolve to control decks playing things like Fidget or Peter Pan Shadow to be able to answer Mini. Sapphire decks began playing Cruella, and even Steel decks, who already have access to the most ping damage, including Smash, which costs 3 and deals 3, they still often play Jafar to be able to hit for evasive, because even if your mini does get removed with Smash or Strength for a Raging Fire, we're usually okay with it. That's one less ping card they have for our more significant characters, and if she just got one quest out of it, that was usually enough value. So yeah, Mini was pretty great, and if your Mini was facing down an exerted one, you could play Crab to boost your own to become a 4-3 evasive and take out the opposing one. Now this deck may not be playing Mini, which we'll talk about later, but Crab still feels so important to be able to let more of our early to mid-range characters hit that bit harder, and especially when needing to quickly remove big locations before they give our opponent too much value. Plus, he can always just chill at the Queen's Castle. Next up in our three drops, one of the OGs, Maleficent. If you didn't know, drawing cards is king. More cards gives us more options in how we play the game, whether or not we have a combo piece, whether or not we have the card that can disrupt our opponent's board, more cards equals good. We talked about Kuzgo earlier who lets us draw when he's removed, but Maleficent is an immediate plus one in card count and a body that can quest, boogie at the Queen's Castle, or even be returned to our hand with Snake or Fox to reuse her come into play ability and draw another card. Plus being a 3 cost means that on our turn 4, we can have her sing our next 3 cost card and our first song, I got friends on the other side. Not too much more to say about this really. A staple of Amethyst decks since chapter 1, drawing a card is good. Drawing two cards is great, and being able to sing this, meaning that we don't have to dip into our ink pool for the turn to dig for certain pieces or just build up our options, is brilliant. Our last three cost, except locations, but we'll look at those last, is one of my favourite additions to the deck, our singular item, Maui's Fishhook. It makes the most sense to talk about this in conjunction with our five cost Maui cards, so let's do that first. Since chapter 1, Maui has been another of the game's most powerful cards. Rush is so important for helping to immediately remove threats and level boards, and Maui having a 6-5 stat line is full on bonkers. He hits hard enough to take out a large percentage of the meta, and the 5 willpower means quite often he survives the hit and remains on board to put even more work or demand opposing removal. The introduction of locations makes him more important than ever before, taking some out in one hit, or providing a good chunk of the damage needed to take out bulkier ones like McDuck Manor. Our fishhook lets us use its secondary shapeshift ability for free if we have Maui on board, so there are a lot of situations where you're able to simply exert the hook to gain its effect without making an additional ink cost. But it's worth saying that I've had plenty of board states with Fishhook without Maui, and paying its 2 ink cost was perfectly reasonable for the effect I was getting. Now the effect itself. Giving a plus 3 strength is great. We talked about the benefits of doing so when we discussed Merlin Crab. Big strong characters equals good. And if you're able to put down Maui with Fishhook already on board, then you can make him hit for 9, which will deal with nearly every single character in the game and every single location including McDuck Manor. The other ability to provide evasive is one of the reasons I have decided to cut Mini from my lists. There are other reasons, which we'll get to later, but it gives us a great response to her on the draw. As long as we get Snake or Rafiki down on turns 1 or 2, if they quest their Mini turn 4, we can use our turn 4 to pay 2 for the hook to give evasive to our Snake and immediately take her out. Or if they didn't quest, how about we use that other 2 ink to play Pinocchio? Mini is one of the big ones, but any evasive threats the fish hook is going to help us deal with, along with just becoming evasive ourselves so that we can quest freely, knowing they likely won't be able to challenge us. 
This diverse ability has proven really, really useful. I would potentially go to a 3 just to see it early more often. But whenever we look at items, we need to consider how much item removal is being played. As it stands, based on data from our first few tournaments of the season, the only consistent item removal we are seeing is the new Rise of the Titans, which is predominantly being played to deal with locations, but its flexibility is good for steel players. The thing is, we want to take advantage of locations ourselves, so if they are playing Rise of the Titans and they use it on our fish hook, that's not always awful for us. More decks could look to start running item removal, it is available to Sapphire and Emerald, so a change in the meta could end up forcing the fish hook back out, but for now it's feeling pretty safe, and the immediate and long term value it can provide may keep it in control decks even if there is a raise in item removal. Moving on to our four costs, we have our other two Merlin cards that benefit from entering and leaving play, synergizing really well with our Madam Min Bounce cards. First of all, Merlin Goat. An absolute menace on the meta since his release. Giving us a plus one lore bump just for putting him down is nice. Getting another when he leaves the board is great. The option to continue to bounce him back to your hand and keep playing him and gaining lore with every bounce is game breaking. <laughs> The 4-3 stat line is also not insignificant, 4 is a nice chunk of damage to hit 4 into a lot of characters and locations. Goat is a card that can close really tight games. You could be at 18-18 to 18 on your final turn before your opponent is about to quest for game, and just being able to draw a goat, play him, and then do one bounce to steal the game doesn't feel fair at times. Always be aware of how much of a lore jump you can get from GOAT, and if that's enough to put you far enough ahead that your onboard characters can race to game before your opponent. Also, don't always feel committed to getting the GOAT down. He is quite often an early ink target for me, and sometimes you want to have enough ink to be able to play him and immediately bounce him back to keep him safe, but he is rarely our preferred turn 4 play. That role is usually filled by Merlin Rabbit, the card draw machine. We have established that drawing one card is good. Doing so every time Rabbit enters and leaves play can generate so much value that you just start to steamroll your opponent. The fact that Rabbits will draw you a card even if they are banished is good for all the reasons we highlighted with Kuzgo, letting you pressure the board more without being quite so punished if your board is wiped. That being said, while you can quest fairly freely with Rabbits without being too punished in card count if he's removed, you still want to be careful. Preferably, we want to loop these Rabbits as much as we possibly can throughout the entire game, especially in the later stages when we're making bigger plays as we may be using multiple cards from our hand in a turn, but we want to be replacing those resources as much as we can along the way. The goal of Lorcana really is to outvalue your opponent, so if you can continue to answer your opponent's big plays or just make big plays yourself, but keep your pool of cards healthy while your opponent is depleted, you should outvalue them in the long run. Always look to remove opposing rabbits when you can and take that card draw engine away from them. Too many players are scared of challenging into rabbits as they don't want the opponent drawing a card, but that card draw is going to happen eventually anyway and you're just giving them more chances to find ways of bouncing it and that plus one they were getting in card count is now a minimum of plus three. Rabbits are some of your best friends in control. Get used to the mirror match being a standoff of Merlin bunnies. Why you gotta disrespect, bro? I do respect you, bro. Show some respect, bro. I do respect you, bro. Stop disrespecting, bro. I respect you, bro. Okay, I respect you too. Okay. These were enough to push Maleficent out of a lot of Ruby Amethyst decks in set 2 format, but I like having a couple of extra draw options, especially for the mirror. On to our 5 costs. I'm going to talk about Jim last along with our locations. So instead, let's look to Dragon's Fire. Once a regular 2 to 4 of in Chapter 1 format, which fell off after the release of Rise of the Floodborne, largely due to Lady Tremaine, who we aren't running anymore in favour of the boss, but she can't deal with everything, so Dragon's Fire is really nice targeted removal, which bar anything with Ward, will always be able to deal with the exact threat on the board that you want gone. Now Madame Medusa herself, as I mentioned Lady Tremaine became a common 2 to 4 of in most set 2 control decks, as her ability built into a body with a 3-4 stat line and questing for 2 was very strong. Obviously the trade off with Tremaine is that her ability allows the opponent to choose which character is banished. 
Now this does get around Ward, which was pretty cool, but in a lot of cases it made Lady Tremaine fairly easy to play around, as you would only need to play a cheap character alongside your more important one to have that be the character you choose to remove. Despite this, she still saw a lot of play, and I do think is still a good card, but the introduction of Madame Medusa, at least in my mind, and currently echoed by the results we've had so far, completely outshines the Imperious Queen. Six cost and uninkable is the same cost as Tremaine. The 4-4 stat line makes her a little bit stronger at the cost of only questing for one, but the ability being able to target the character you want to remove is what makes her far more valuable. The prerequisite of that character having three strength or less is actually good enough for a lot of the targets we would want to quickly remove. Beast Tragic Hero has been another of the best cards in the game since set 2, and he will immediately fall to Medusa. And if you're on the play, you can do so before they even get a single piece of advantage from him. There are so many other viable targets for Medusa to take out which make her a lot more valuable than Lady Tremaine in my opinion. Some control decks are already playing 4, I think 3 is probably more reasonable, especially as you can bounce her to recycle the ability if you need to, but so far just 2 has usually been enough for me, especially as I'm also running the 2 dragons fires to be able to deal with bigger characters that Medusa can't, and I'm really trying to watch the uninkables. Next up, we've talked a lot about the best cards in the game. Well here is one that I think can be argued is the best card in the game, and certainly the one that's had the most impact on top cuts through events so far. Be prepared is our big red button, it's our standards and practices check. If we see something we don't like, cancelled. Be prepared is a great comeback card, allowing your opponent to run away with the board state just to wipe them all in one play. In any game involving Ruby, both players should be constantly aware of the approaching turn 7 when Be Prepared comes online and always need to respect it. It punishes overextension and even allows us to make a couple of risky plays and still be prepared our way back into contention. Set 3 has given Emerald and Amber powerful ways to help prevent our Be Prepared, meaning we should always be throwing it back into our deck on the mulligan if we can against those inks. Although you should probably throw it back in your mulligan against any ink, to be honest. But these cards are great and will certainly help keep control a little more in check going forward. But we have so much draw that it's perfectly reasonable to draw back into it later. Perhaps off of a sung friends on the other side on turn 7 so we can still immediately play it. Nonetheless, be careful with your be prepared when facing Amber and Emerald decks, as their best pilots will wait until their turn 6 to play their discard, trying to catch you out right before you have access to it. Next up, another OG Maleficent, this time in the form of a monstrous dragon. A regular 4 of in Chapter 1 control decks, this expensive card provides instant targeted removal and sticks around as a formidable 7-5 body who quests for 2. It wasn't uncommon in Chapter 1 to have control players in a mirror match holding 3 or 4 copies of the dragon wanting their opponent to be the one to start the exchange of removal. In set 2, Maleficent fell off a little bit partly due to the format speeding up and her turn 9 drop not always being feasible, but also because Lady Tremaine came along and while we've established her removal could be played around, a lot of the time she still ended up getting her value. Plus a larger emphasis was placed on the 7 cost Ursula, so not all control players felt the need for Maleficent as well, but she would still pop up as a 2-3 to three of, as she's still a powerful card, and not to mention she's something else that can be bounced and reused. At first, I must admit, I thought set 3 had sped the format up even more to the point where Maleficent Dragon would fall off completely, but I was wrong. Most control players moving from Tremaine to Medusa means that the dragon is safe from one of the main removal cards control is commonly playing, meaning be prepared will likely be required to remove it outside of challenging. This is one of the other reasons I like playing Dragon's Fire. But early set 3 control lists doing well were playing a 1 or 2 count of her, so I thought I'd give her some testing and she just felt good to have. Plus, she can always be ink, but I think the 2 count is probably right. Lastly, let's take a look at locations. They're an interesting addition to the game. Outside of their abilities, or the abilities of characters that just want to be at locations, they essentially act as aggro pieces with willpower slightly above what would typically go on characters of around that cost. The flip side being that they don't have a strength of their own, meaning characters can challenge into them without the fear of taking any damage in return. 
Sometimes this can just result in you getting maybe a 1 or 2 lore bump, but ultimately losing the location courtesy of 1 or 2 challenges from the opponent, but you haven't done any damage to their board at all. But sometimes just the distraction to stop them questing so much can help, or just to make them start challenging and exerting their characters so that your board can then challenge into them directly. One big advantage of locations though is that there is far less removal for them. We have Rise of the Titans in Steel, along with a couple of other actions that do ping damage to them, but there is nowhere near as much location removal as there is character removal. When it comes to cards like Hades, Grab Your Swords, Be Prepared, locations just don't care. And if you can get one or two down after a board clear when your opponent does have many cards left, they may stick around for two or three turns and net you enough of a lore jump to secure the game. Of all the ones we have so far, I think there's a strong case to be made that the Queen's Castle is the best one we have. I've always said that drawing cards is king. Well, I guess I should have been saying that drawing cards is queen. This 4 cost inkable location has 7 willpower, keeping it out of range of a single Maui, unless he has his fish hook. 2 passive lore gain is a great bonus, and the ability to draw an extra card at the start of your turn for every character attending the castle is absolutely bonkers. This card alone is one of the reasons so many decks are now prioritising big beat stick characters or ways to make characters stronger, along with high counts of rush and our limited location removal. Because if the opponent can get down a Queen's Castle and move just one or two characters there, the advantage that that's going to net may just decide the game there and then. When the castle goes down and characters visit, that castle has to go ASAP. That being the case, we know we need to be careful with our own copies and use them wisely. Sometimes we may just need to use it as bait to slow our opponent down or tempt them into exerting, but really we want to hold off until we've seen our opponent use some of their most common location removal, such as Maui or Along Came Zeus. We want to whittle down their resources, clear their board, and then be able to slam this down, move a couple of cheap characters there, and hope our opponent doesn't have the answer. Because if they don't, we cook it. Our second location is Agrabah, which has no ability and acts as a simple two passive lore gain with five willpower. Now for me, this was originally the RLS Legacy, which is a very strong card and an absolutely understandable consideration. It's expensive to move to, unless you already have a character there, in which case the cost of one is quite reasonable to give all your characters evasive. Also the eight willpower is quite a big body which won't be easy to get through at all. But ultimately, my decision to cut the Legacy was down to firstly a desire to play less uninkables while prioritising other ones, but also because I decided to move to a low account of Jim. Jim is a 5 cost inkable who can rush any of our locations into play as soon as you play him. He also immediately moves to that location, making him a great partner for the RLS Legacy, so you'll immediately be able to move other characters there for only one ink. My testing with Jim has been diverse. Half the time I really like him and half the time I feel like he's really overrated, at least for now. To fully utilise him, you're immediately playing two cards down from your hand, which can be a thing of little consequence if you've built up a nice big hand, but if resources are limited, it can feel like a very all-in play, especially if you're making that play into a board that already has opposing characters ready and waiting to just banish your location. Plus, even playing into an empty board, you always have to be wary of the Maui plus Fishhook or plus Crab or plus Fox play. And yes, that still leaves Jim Hawkins, who is a 4-4, 2 lore character, which is fine. Don't get me wrong, in situations where you deplete your opponent's resources and clear their board before slamming down Jim and the Queen's Castle and moving another one or two characters there and then they can't answer it, that feels great. But you could have just played the Queen's Castle and achieved basically the same thing, just one less gym, which could maybe just be a different low cost character if you've got an ink pool of maybe eight and above in the late game. Overall, I still like Jim, but the two count for me has been more than enough, and I could end up moving to cut him completely. That being the case, the Four Queens Castle would be fine on its own, but I like having the extra location target if I am playing Jim. Plus, Agrabah can cheat you a nice 2-4 to four lore if you pick the right moment to play it, or even just bait out the fast removal so that you're then safer to play the more important Queens Castle. So yeah, I'm enjoying Agrabah. 
And that is my list. I have no doubt that within weeks or even days of releasing this video, my thoughts may have changed on some things, plus just the natural development of the meta and what's being played will always cause adaption. But as it stands, I'm really enjoying this build. I must admit, set 2 had me kind of longing for the days of chapter 1. I'm probably the minority, but chapter 1 Ruby Amethyst Mirror Match was my absolute favourite time to play the game. It felt so chess-like and I always had a lot of fun playing or watching those games. Set 2 brought a lot of fun stuff, but the RA Mirror didn't feel as interesting to me. So far with set 3, I'm getting some of that same enjoyment I had in chapter 1. I really like the addition of locations, we got some good upgrades, and other decks gain tools that we need to be more wary of, giving us something else to consider when piloting control. Now let's talk about some considerations. I already talked about her a bunch, so let's start with Mini Stylish Surfer. For what it's worth, I don't think that she is now bad by any means. In fact, I may end up running her again myself before too long, so I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to. Yes, she can be removed quickly, but that was the case last format too, and she still put in a lot of work. I think the addition of Madame Medusa does hurt her a bit, and the fact that cards like Ursula have prompted so many decks to run ways of efficiently dealing with key 3 drop characters as soon as they go down also doesn't help. The addition of Fishhook isn't a lot different from when people were just running their own mini plus crab to be the answer, but then at least you could just not quest and hold off a bit. Now, so many decks are looking to run the Pinocchio, so the line of Snake into Fishhook into Pinocchio may be a little too consistent to let mini provide enough value. My main reason for the cut is less to do with her and more to do with my desire that every single character of 3 cost or higher must be able to provide immediate value. If you look at my characters from Madame Mim Fox onwards, they all immediately do something when they enter the board, whether drawing, banishing, gaining lore, raising strength or rushing in locations, everything is proactive. There's nothing wrong with running characters like Mini that are just there to sit defensively in quest, but I like to play a far more aggressive game, and so far I've not missed many. Next up, another card we've talked about a lot, Lady Tremaine. As I established, I just think that Medusa outclasses her as the meta currently stand, but that's not to say that sometimes you do wish the Medusa was Tremaine. There's definitely an argument to running both, and if you don't like the Dragon's Fires, then I would for sure go with a one or two count of Tremaine, as she's still a very strong card. RLS Legacy, like I said, is more to do with our balance of uninkables and the fact I've moved away from a high account of Jim. But if you do like the 4 Jim, then I think that does warrant a 1 or 2 off of the Legacy. Yzma is a fantastic diverse card, being able to either remove an imposing threat or just bounce one of our characters back to the deck for a 2 card draw. I'm a big fan of Yzma and there's a good chance she replaces Jim for me down the line, maybe you'd like to go that way too. Another reason to potentially run Yzma is because of Mufasa which was a strong deck in set 2 and I think gets a lot stronger in set 2 and in my experience Ruby Amber Mufasa has a pretty decent control matchup so Yzma definitely helps that. The Sorceress Spellbook is another high consideration, especially while not many decks are running much item removal. The extra passive lore gain can help you stay ahead in the race, plus just putting Spellbook down puts the game on a timer that your opponent must now respect, especially if they don't have access to item removal, making Spellbook good in the mirror match for breaking stalemates and pressuring your opponent to start making plays. Last Ditch Effort is a pretty cute tech that does a similar job to our Pinocchio. In fact, against turn 3 drops such as Ursula, Last Ditch Effort can be a little bit better as you don't need to hit the snake and can instead give plus 3 to any of your smaller characters along with exerting and take them out that way. Overall, I think Pinocchio is better as you can reuse him with your bounce stuff and he's a body that can quest and boogie at the castle. But Last Ditch Effort certainly has its appeal. Teeth and Ambitions is Ruby's only access to ping damage and synergized particularly well in set 2 decks which were only playing 1 drops that had a 1-3 stat line. Now that we've moved to more of those 1 drops only having 2 willpower, that alone makes Teeth feel less useful. 
It's great for aggro, but we're running Pinocchios, which can help us in that matchup, along with a respectable count of 1 and 2 drops in general. From turn 3 we have Fox, and from there, aggro shouldn't be too hard to keep in check, especially once you know you're playing it. Teeth has some other uses, especially if you decide to play Prince Eric, but since we aren't, and as our 1 drops look how they do, and again, Pinocchio is pretty good, Teeth and Ambitions has not felt very needed to me. Prince Eric was hailed as one of the best new cards and a sure addition to control. Eric is good, and if you do decide to play Teeth and Ambitions, then I definitely think he's warranted as a two count. Mostly, it comes down to him being uninkable, and despite the ability being pretty good, four often seems too expensive for how slow he usually is. He's okay, and definitely something I find annoying to face in certain board states, but overall, I think we have far better ways of removing targets, and Pinocchio gives us ways to do it through challenging from turn 2, so that feels better to me. When it comes to the mulligan, like we mentioned earlier, you want to think about your curve. What are you playing on the first three turns of the game? This could be influenced if you know what inks and cards your opponent is playing, as that will alert you to the cards you might want to hold on to. The only uninkable I would sometimes keep in my opening hand would be Pinocchio, if I feel I need him. Besides that, you could potentially hold Rabbit if the rest of your hand already provides a good curve plus ink options, because getting our draw engine going early is important, but don't prioritise holding him or anything else over trying to find your 1 and 2 drops. Against Emerald, you should always throw songs away. Against Amber, I would throw back any non-character card, unless you're planning to immediately use it for ink. Locations we don't usually want to see until later on in the game, so they're pretty good cards to throw back. Unless you're against aggro and you have another 1 and 2 drop to fend off the board state and then aggro bar can help you aggro yourself. There's often a temptation to hold Maui, especially against decks using locations, because not having him, if our opponent does go for the early drop of Queen's Castle or McDuck Manor, can really hurt. But we have three crabs, so even if we don't find another Maui, we should have okay odds to find one of those instead. And as long as we curve, we should be able to immediately deal with a turn 4 or 5 location from them. Fishhook is sometimes good to hold against Ruby Amethyst, especially if they have revealed that they're playing mini, but any of these tips should always be ignored when you're opening hand and the matchup calls for it. Really, we just want to see a one drop plus a snake or a Kuzgo, preferably into a fox or a Maleficent on turn three, or the hook if the matchup calls for it. Knowing you have an early path to card draw is good, but really, you just have to know the matchups the best you can and adapt as and when you need to. And there you have it, my control deck along with the purpose for every card and my justification for them. This started off as just a few bullet points about control to keep me on track when I went over the deck, and it's turned into a 16 page script on a complete guide to control, but I did say I wanted to do more scripted content, so I figured I'd just keep going with it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this, it's taken a lot of work, uh, please if you uh, got to this point point, you haven't hit the like button do please do so, but now let's jump into a game. This channel is also sponsored by Whatnot, if you're not already a Whatnot customer you can sign up using my link to get £10 off your first purchase. Alright so let's jump into a game, we're going first which always helps, uh, so our opening hand, yep yeah, so we get rid of, so go could easily be ink, it's not something we're worried about building to on our curve, um, not not preferably. Maleficent Dragon isn't going to be active until far later on in the game, so that's nearly always thrown back. There are exceptions, times where you might hold it just to ink it, um, because it's, especially because we're running two, and especially if you're running uh, more Maleficents, if you know you're against something like aggro, then depending on the rest of your hand, maybe you'd keep it just to ink, but that again, it would depend on the rest of your hand. You need to make sure you've got early things to respond to that aggro. Uh, Medusa's uninkable and not going to be online for a while. Jim Hawkins, we've discussed we don't want to see him until much later. Rabbit, there's an argument that we could have kept that. Um, but we've got our Rafiki, we've got our one drop, we've got our two drop. This is pretty nice, so I'd like to be able to look for a, th a three drop, um, potentially, and, and yeah, just see what else we can get. So I could have kept the Rabbit, that, that would have been quite understandable. But yeah, we're, we're, we are rewarded with a bunch of inkables. Um, so I opt to throw the Olaf. The reason I go... So this is a decision that you'll have to come to if you've got both these one drops in your hand. Because I'm against Ruby Amethyst, I know that they do have access to Teeth and Ambitions, but that's the only thing that they could use as an action song to remove Rafiki. 
Now, they could be playing that, but because we're on the play, because we're going first, I don't mind playing this. They put down, even if they put down a 1-3. Um, we then on turn two go Kuzco. And if they want to use their turn two to um, sing, uh, to card cast um, Teeth and Ambitions, take out Rafiki, that's a pretty slow turn two from them, which I'm pretty okay with. Alternatively, they could just put down the snake on turn two and then wait to sing Teeth and Ambitions on turn three. But if they want to do that, I'm okay with that. I think I think that's perfectly fine. So we have to go with the Rafiki line. Uh, they ink an Olaf and throw down a mini of their own. So I've still got to be aware that, as I just uh, highlighted, that Teeth and Ambitions play is on the board. We throw away the castle. Again, You don't be worried about throwing these. We're running four of them. We don't want to see them until later in the game anyway. And if I am putting one of my current four cost cards down on turn four it's probably more likely to be the goat at this point in time but yeah we throw away the castle for now get down that coos go just start to extend our board um i do consider questing but it, it's not worth it um they ink a goat throw down a snake returning the mini to their hand and pass we draw a madame medusa uh yeah we do opt to ink the goat I mean, I, i'm happy to just hard play and pay for friends on the other side here we don't have another three drop but this is quite reasonable to me i'm also happy to quest here with coos Who's go? Um, if they want to challenge in, I'm, I, the cards are placing itself, and I'm drawing a card, and then Rafiki takes out Snake, and that's a two for one on ter in terms of on-board characters. But it's I, I, Kuzgo replaces himself, and Rafiki trading for Snake is quite favourable, so I'm happy with that. They uh, draw the Inca Crab, they throw down Pinocchio to exert my Rafiki. Uh, and immediately take him out, taking no damage because he has zero strength. He's just a challenger three. They throw down Mini with their final bit of ink and pass over to us. We draw a fox. We ink it immediately. Throw down this rabbit. Where it's in a mirror match. Uh, well, any against any deck, we, we want to draw. But in the mirror match, they have access to it as well. So we want to start building our resources as quick as we can. We draw it to a be prepared for later. Qu uh, quest with the Kuzgo and pass. They ink a goat. Throw down a Merlin Rabbit to draw a card. They quest up with their snake and with their mini. They choose not to go into the Coos Go, which I do think is a mistake. I know it's letting me draw a card, but this is a body that's going to sit there and it's going to quest more. And um, They don't know if I'm running Teeth and Ambition, so it might be something easy to sing and then put the self-damage on. And yeah, just they, 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 they should be trying to swarm the board, really, in my opinion. Uh, I can't see their hand and, and I don't know their thought trail, but I'm, I'm pleased to see that they chose not to challenge in. They opt just to, to quest up. Um, what They want me to be the ones to be doing the challenging, but still, I, I personally would have got rid of the um, got rid of the coups go we go into the mini with our rabbit doing two chip damage we bounce the rabbit back to our hand with the fox which allows us to draw an additional card we then finish off the mini with the coups go which is a trade and bought in um no it's not even a trade i survive it because i've got two willpower so take her out for free and then the fox goes into the snake uh, which is a fine trade i mean fox is more valuable than snake um but it's fine i got a lot of value out that turn and it gets it off the board so that's it for me. They throw me a well played. Thank you very much. Uh, we ink a fox. They throw down Maleficent to draw themselves a card. So they sing friends on the other side with the rabbit to draw some more. They ink the teeth and ambition. So they are playing it. Um, they return the rabbit with a the snake. And they, they've got their draw engine going. And a bit more of a board than me. They trade their Pinocchio into my Kuzgo. Which does let me draw. So building up resources. So I've got more cards in hand. But I think it, the, the card total is about the same. But they've got a bit of a board. We draw into friends on the other side. We just ink that at this point. We don't have, a, to be fair, there's not a lot of options here to ink. Um, we've drawn quite unfavorably in terms of our uninkables. We've got a Maui and a Fox here, both of which are important. So we ink that, friends. And I just throw down the Medusa. Just get this snake off the board. Take that pressure off. Um, make their, if they're playing Tremaine, which will be online for them on this turn six, then make make you play it. I, I, want, I want to pressure the board. I want them to keep playing cards. And then eventually, hopefully, maybe get a nice um, be prepared with, big value so we just go with the medusa they sing friends on the other side maleficent all the draw they throw down at madame min fox returning the maleficent ink the goat and throw down maleficent to draw another card just recycling of these draw resources but they pass over to us our medusa lives we throw down rabbit draw ourselves an additional card um this is a decision here because i kind of would like to play the maleficent um i don't want to give up either of the maui's ruby amethyst they're going to be important cards um, and this allows me still to bounce this rabbit. I think I'm 
No, I, I only played the rabbit this turn. For a moment, I thought I forgot to quest, but no, I only played it on this turn. Uh, we quest up with Medusa. Again, if they want to trade with their fox, and that's I'm perfectly fine with that. They draw, they throw down the queen's castle. They do make that trade into the boss. They throw down mini. They ink, and then with the two ink they've got, they move both these characters to the Queen Castle. But this is where, like, you've got to be careful of when you're making these Queen's Castle plays, because that was a six ink investment that they just made when they had to know that Maui plus the character I have on board just deals with this. If I didn't have a character on board, then this would be a perfectly reasonable line, because at the, uh, to be fair, I think I can go up to eight ink this turn. Yeah, I can. So, I, to be fair, even if I didn't have a board, then I can go Maui Crab. Although that's a bit more reasonable for them to like just take the risk and hope that I don't have both those pieces. Although I've got a big hand. But as it stands, all I need is Maui um, or just another fox. So, I think just having this fox on the board um, or just a crab. Like, literally, there are so many options I have to be able to instantly remove this queen's castle. So, I, don't, I again, I don't know their hand, so I don't know how many options they had. Maybe they didn't have any and they just had to take this plunge. But this would be a situation where... Uh, that this is not the best time to be playing the Queen's Castle because I've got really good odds to be able to deal with it. Um, so we do have the Maui. We, we double in. Uh, I do choose to ink. I still, yeah, like, again, it feels bad because I would like to just play more of these cards that are going to draw me cards. Uh, but I do want to get up to Maleficent and I've got a rabbit in my hand, so... It's, uh, we, we make peace with it. They throw down a Maui, go into our Fox wisely, um, and they choose not to uh, not not to quest. Which, like, I know I would just take them out straight away. I suppose their fort trail is well. I have to go into your Maui, and then they can quest freely. So yeah, it's fair. I think I put the explanation point up here just to signify there's a few lines I could have taken here. Um, in fact, yeah, I don't know if this was the best one. Yeah, I went for a Queen's Castle play. Um, yeah, I don't think that was the... Yeah, I think that's why I've put that explanation point up. Because I don't think that's the best... As I just highlighted, not the best Queen's Castle play from them. To be fair, I'm not sure that was the best Queen's Castle play from me. Because I'm going to take out this Maui. Um, but all they need is another one. Or... I think I might have just been wanting to pressure them into building the board state. Into a build, uh, be prepared. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure this was necessarily the best choice from me going with the Queen's Castle play here. I probably should have um, just gone with the Rabbit. So yeah, f fair game, boss. If I'm going um, to cr criticize, feels like the wrong word because I, I, I can't see their hand. But if I'm going to talk about why I think theirs might have been a mistake, let's talk about mine as well. Uh, they have to throw down a Rabbit, draw a card. They do challenge him with the um, Maleficent and the Mini. But they do not have the Maui, but they have the Fox. So that, yeah, that's another line that they can quite reasonably achieve to be able to take it out, bouncing their rabbit out of their hand. So yeah, definitely not the best one from me. Um, we They pass though. We draw into a be prepared. We opt just to throw down the rabbit. This is not a good value be prepared as it stands. Um, and I'm able to find myself a snake and bounce this rabbit back to my hand. I do opt to just quest here. Why not? Like they're going to have to um, make them make the trade into me. I mean, they can do it in one with Madame Mim Fox, but that's fine with me. I, I Alternatively, I could have gone into the Maleficent or the Mini, um, but I want to get some more uh, questing done. I want to get some more lore, so we choose to go that way. They ink a Mini. They do make the trade into Jim Hawkins. They throw down a Rabbit, drawing themselves a card. They throw down a Queen's Castle, and uh, they've only got one ink, so they send Merlin Rabbit there. Another situation where, like, this Maui really important. Um, crab wouldn't have been enough, and I don't even have it. Um, so, yeah, you got to be really careful with your Mauis, and we do to opt to go into the Queen's Castle. No way I want them. I'm, I'm, wanna, I'm gonna let them start getting draw value from that. Um, we ink, we're able to throw down Rabbit and pass. They throw down Med Medusa, who takes out our Rabbit wisely, I think. Um, we draw into another snake. They uh, extend some more, throwing down the fox. Um, they trade. It takes two, it's a two for one, but they manage to get the Maui off the board. But that took up a lot of their resources, and I've still got a snake here, and they've only got two lore total sitting on the board from their characters. So I'm quite happy with that little transaction that went down. We throw down a rabbit, just keep drawing, just keep drawing. Uh, return the rabbit, just keep drawing. We find ourselves a couple of crabs now. We ink one of them, get, them, get ourselves up to 10. We've got a nice big hand. 
why not? We, let's keep drawing cards. Let's have all the options. So we throw down another rabbit, draw a card. We just quest up with um, Snake. Uh, yes, they can take her out with Madam Mim, um, with Medusa. But then I'm perfectly happy to then go into that with something else. I've got a crab in my hand. I'll even happily make the trade with Rabbit, potentially. Um, but yeah, there's no point sitting here at a stalemate. Let's make them play the game. And I've got a lot of removal options. So like I said, let's make them play the game. Uh, they throw down a couple of rabbits, drawing themselves a more card. And this is what I'm talking about. You want to recycle these rabbits as much as you can. You want them coming to the coming being played as so many times they do um go into my character which is fine i do opt to make the trade into medusa so i am giving up a rabbit here but i'm able to throw down another one immediately drawing all the cards that ever did was uh we throw down a, uh, a goat for put some more pressure on the board quest up with the snake they ink an olaf they quest up with everything and they go for a be prepared here and i'm quite happy with this this like i've not got much on the board at all yes it takes away another one of my rabbits and i've already lost one or two um, but losing a goat and a snake isn't a big deal. Yes, they're going to draw a couple of cards off of theirs, but they're now losing a couple of rabbits. So, like, and you want these rabbits gone because you want there to be an end to this constant machine that is the rabbit card draw. Um, so yeah, they finish up, rest of their ring, throw down a rabbit, draw a card, and pass over to us. I just hard play friends on the other side, give myself some more options. Fred and Medusa, again, let's get rid of these rabbits. I think I do a rabbit check here. Yeah, I think that was three gone now. Throw down an Olaf as well. I don't know if they're running Tremaine. Um, and again, I've, I've, I've got the cards in my hand. I've got plenty of ink. Let's put some more lore on the board, baby. Um, they throw down a Rabbit, which I think is their last one. Yeah, it's their last. So three three gone. And I think that's two Maui's gone. And they just inked another one. Um, they extend here with Stylish Surfer, Mini Coos go. And they throw down the Fish Hook. Um, again, I don't need to be prepared this board. The only thing that scares me is the Mini um, until I find my own um, Fish Hook. So we just Dragon's Fire that. We exert the, the rabbit. Let's get that off the field. So now that's all their rabbits gone. So their draw engine is now gone. Don't get me wrong. They have other things that can draw cards. But while there are rabbits and things to bounce, it will it will seem never ending. And they are forced to go with the be prepared after me um, dealing with that board. They finish off by throwing down a Kuzgo. Ink a mini up to 13. Throw down a goat to nearly equalize. But then my Queen's Castle has stuck on the board. Um, yeah, that's why they had to had to do the, pan the, the panic button. Because I had cards that were going to let me draw. No, I didn't. I just went back and rewatch that no but i still had like a bit of board presence and again i was already going up to 12 law from this castle and then that would have been some more questing so they need to just slow me down so yeah the queen's castle managed to get me a nice law bump i do opt to just be prepared here get these guys off the board because they've got hardly any resources going on um yeah I, I, i'm half defending this be prepared that that did shock me just a moment to see that i was like oh okay but what else could i have really done I could have gone Maleficent, but I don't want to start that trade. As far as I'm aware, they're, they're probably running them as well. Um, so yeah, this gives them a lore. It gives them another uh, card draw. But yeah, it's just taking some lore off the board. And I think we're far enough into the game. And I'm I'm quite, I'm ahead on resources. And it's my first one being used. It's not that it doesn't feel like the best be prepared. But I do, I think it's okay to just play that there. Like, I don't think it's wise to start my Maleficent um, trade here. And it allows me to finish off by throwing down Agrabah. And now they have to answer so much. Um, they throw down a Queen's Castle, a Pinocchio, and a Snake. They bounce the Pinocchio back. They, they just extend as much as they possibly can. Because like, look at that law bump I get up to 16. And yeah, I just throw another be prepared at this point. Because now they've got three cards in their hand. Even Maui deals with Agrabah. But they need Maui. Um, that's to be fair, the fish hooks on the board. So yeah, Ma Maui is an answer. But they've they've gone through three at least. Maybe more. Um, I may have actually even confirmed that they that was their last Maui. Um, yeah, they throw me the be prepared the well play Because I can't. Uh, they, they can't deal with both of these locations. We throw down a crab just to put it at the Queen's Castle in case they do have Maui. Um, although I wouldn't draw anyway because they would definitely take out the Queen's Castle. But yeah, they extend as much as they can. Pinocchio, they throw down the Madame Medusa as well. We boost this Pinocchio up. The last card in their ha hand is Medusa and we take the dub. So yeah, just out-resourced them in the end. Again, like, it's hard to tell uh, without seeing their hand just, like, what what options they had at different points that may have made it go a different way. But yeah, game felt good. I missed my fish hook, uh, but Agrabah putting in some work, and we did get some use out of Queen's Castle, even if it wasn't actually drawing. So we go into game two. 
throw away all of these pieces. Yeah, again, sometimes it's tempting to keep the Maui against Ruby Amethyst um, when you know they're playing Queen's Castles. But they shouldn't be playing them turn four, really, because like as long as you've curved well, um, you just need a crab normally uh, in com combination with a couple of on-board characters uh, to be able to deal with it, especially because Fox, may like, you could also Fox. Um, so, yeah, like, we you throw it away in, 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 in favour of finding things you need. And to be fair, we have found some, good, like, we've got our Rafiki, we've got two two drops. I keep them both, depending, because, like, I can make the decision based on what they do, which way I want to go. Uh, but I also need ink. I don't want to ink Maui. Um, I don't want to ink the Maleficent, even though I didn't, I don't think I saw any from them, but they could easily have them, and, like, Maleficent's good to have in this match, because the, the, the matches tend to go long, um, depending on, like, spellbook counts and things like that. Anyway, they go first, they ink a mini, and they throw down a mini. We opt to, yeah, we just get rid of one of these Kuzgos goes because we drew another. Throw down the Rafiki again. I know they're running the Teeth and Ambitions, but I'm probably bouncing it with my Snake this turn. Throw away the Queen's Castle. Don't need that right now. Um, and I don't want to give up any of the other Inkables in my hand. Yeah, I do opt to take this route. So yeah, I am risking Teeth and Ambitions here. Um, but that's quite a passive turn, really, I would say. Well, no, it's not an awful turn. Yeah, I do risk the Teeth and Ambitions here because they could... Yeah, they sing it with Kuzgo. They put the damage probably on Mini, take out my Rafiki, um, and then they're still free to uh, play Snake or Fox. Um, but, I mean, it's fine. Like, I've got a Kuzgo on the board. I'm playing Maleficent next turn or the Snake if I need to. Um, you could you could argue it's a risky line when I run when they're running Teeth and Ambitions. But, nonetheless, they quest with the Mini, Inca Crab, bounce that Mini back with the Fox, and they do not have said teeth we draw into a second maui i do it uh, i do ink one D never feels great but play the hand you've got we throw down maleficent to get ourselves some card draw i'm happy to quest here if they want to go in with fox then fine by me i'm there i'm, the I'm then ha probably happy to make the trade with maleficent or rafiki and i'm drawing another card anyway but again they let me keep it um two games in a row where they've ju they've just wanting to be really passive they don't want me to remove their fox um and they might want it there like they might have just drawn into a friends on the other side Although they could sing it with Rabbit next turn. Uh, but they, they choose to play passively. Um, and just let me get away with a free quest. So I do another one with Maleficent here. I bounce it back with the snake. Uh, mostly because I want to ink it. I don't want to ink another Maui. And, and like it makes more sense than inking the snake, I, I I think. We throw down the Pinocchio, exert this fox, which I then trade with the Rafiki, which is really nice. Another good use for uh, Pinocchio. We quest up with um, Kuzco, pass over to them. They ink, they do opt to go into our Kuzco, finally get rid of it, putting one damage on their bunny. We draw ourselves a card. They throw down the Queen's Castle and use their last ink to put Kuzco there. But again, I'm going into turn five. Um... I, and I've got on-board characters, so I don't think the best be uh, the best Queen's Castle. We throw away Jim, always throw him away unless, like, it's really situational. Um, I'm already really close to thinking he should just probably just be too Yzma, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, we double into the Queen's Castle, take that out, and then we go into the Rabbit, take that out, and we survive the hit. They draw a card, but that's fine. Um, the card count is pretty even, but we've got more of a board. They throw down a Rabbit, draw themselves a card. They go into our Pinocchio with their Kuzgo, Inca Teeth and Ambitions, to play a Teeth and ambitions was they sing sing for the hard way um onto their rabbit putting two damage on the snake and taking them out and pass over to us i'm so happy to see it well i was just hoping for an inkable to be honest but i'm like okay rabbit to an inkable is also fine um we find another maui though and i really don't want to wink another maui i really don't want to wink another maui so i do opt to pass without inking uh which is risky but i have dragon's fire in my hand i have maui as a response card i even have have one on the board um if i draw another inkable next turn i've got madame medusa on uh, online so it doesn't feel great but we do it uh the quest with rabbit throw down the fox return it draw themselves a card make the trade into maui ink the mini mouse down goes the rabbit drawing 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 we find ourselves another rabbit um which we throw down i'm begging for an inkable we find a be prepared so i quest with the rabbit and once again I opt to not ink. The, that, that's how much respect I'm putting on the name of Maui. Because again, like, I have the Dragon's Fire if I really need it. If I, like, even if I draw another uninkable next turn, if I really need to, I can ink the Maui and play the Medusa. I've got two rabbits on board. They're not likely to be playing Be Prepared at this moment in time. Uh, so it feels really bad, but 
I do it. I, I do do it. They sing friends on the other side with a bunny, ink a crab, throw down the snake to return the rabbit. Drawing, drawing, drawing. This is this is half an RA mirror match. Um, more rabbits, more snakes, more bounces. Uh, we draw into a crab. I'm just I'm happy for the ingable. I've never been so happy to see a crab in my life. <laughs> never, ever, ever. And we do just extend here. Let's get this snake off the board. Let's maybe pressure a be prepared, which because like which doesn't feel great because again. I lose the rabbits, and I, I really want to be recycling them. But I don't have any recycle, so I need to start doing something. Um, so we do indeed end up baiting the bee prepared after they quest with their snake. But we get a double draw, finding ourselves a goat and a friends. They ink a Maui, which I don't agree with, especially when I'm only at six ink. They can absolutely afford to miss a turn. And Maui's so important, but fair. We sing for friends on the other side the hard way. Ink that Merlin go. It's not as an... Imp it's, it's a Merlin go to finisher or like a uh, a pressure card when you're in stalemates but never be afraid to ink them over like drawing uh, cards that draw and cards that can challenge quickly like fox and maui so we've run on the rabbit just drawing 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 uh what bro What's the respect, bro? They throw down a rabbit of their own. What a surprise. <laughs> they ink a Maleficent. Down goes the Medusa, who takes out our bunny. We draw another card. They pass over to us. We find a Queen's Castle. Down goes the Maleficent. Again, just more options to draw. This is why I'm liking the Maleficent again, this format. We do ink the Snake, uh, which never feels good, but Fox is better. We're able to bounce the Maleficent back to our hand, um, exert the rabbit, go into the rabbit without fooling ourselves. And again, we want, we want to get rid of these rabbits. We want to take that engine away from them um and again like i survived so medusa either trades with me or quests and then i take it out so i think this is fine she sings friends they sing friends on the other side down goes mini stylish surfer questing another map sorry inking another maui down goes a couple of goats um and i'm pretty sure this is the easiest be prepared of my life uh, yeah with the amount of value on the field there then absolutely there's some boards where you might just want to dragons fire the mini but there was enough there that was absolutely worth just playing the be prepared and look at my count uh, my card count compared to them now we just pass they throw down a maui for reasons um pass over to us we draw a card we throw down a rabbit Friend I'm Lipson, all the draw, all the draw. Again, I'm happy not to ink. I just value all these cards and like I can play I've got stuff to play the game. I don't need to be higher right now unless I want to play Maleficent. And if I do, then I've got ink in my hand to do so when I'm ready. They throw down the boss, get rid of our rabbit, correct, cool. We draw another card. Pass because they can do nothing else. Well, Maui can't anyway. Um we sing friends on the other side with Maleficent. We finally find that hit fish hook. We now throw down the goat to pressure the board a little bit and kind of like I want to bait them into making bigger plays because I've got two be prepared in my hand two maleficents a dragon's fire They're, like i've got far more options than them so let's bait them into extending the board a little bit more um so we throw down as we do pass over to them they maleficent draw themselves a card they sing friends on the other side pay pay for it the hard way down goes the pinocchio to exert my goat they want that off the field they don't want me recycling it and maui lives that lives to uh to to, 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 to to tell the tale wow that one i struggled with that one to tell the tale uh they ink a mini down goes the queen's castle but they have no ink to move anything there but still it's a threat so what i do here um what do i decide to do i throw down the maui's fish hook we ink the olaf uh we then play maui who because we're uh, because it is indeed maui time we can play this for free which we only need to do on the fox because that gets him up to a 7-3 beat stick which takes out the queen's castle we're then able to go into the, the boss and survive and that gets the most value out of our hand in our turn and now they have to trade with their maui unless they want to bounce it back to their hand or something like that um so i'm perfectly happy with that exchange there they do make the trade into fox they then trade the pinocchio which is a good trade for them they throw down a goat for some pressure of their own quest with the maleficent and pass to us um i do just throw down the maui here go into the maleficent get it off the field i need to respect like they are at 10 they've got a couple of characters on board that can quest we want them we want them gone we ink up we play down the queen's castle we give evasive and we move maui to the queen's castle so they they still absolutely have outs to this but they've they've inked two of their maui's they can just go challenge with goat and then play fox um but that's fine then my maui lives and i'm, I'm pretty okay with that um it's it was quite a passive turn but i don't have a lot of options in my hand really other than the agrabah and they opt to uh to just surrender i don't know why i don't know what their hand was but yeah like just the deck pretty much dominating there and us constantly in high uh, high card count 
But yeah, that's pretty much everything. This video is already massively overrun. Again, if you're someone that really mostly wants the gameplay, within a couple of days of this video coming out, there'll be another video which will be four or five games of Ruby Amethyst with commentary to them all. But I started writing the script for this and uh, I just wanted to go with it. But hopefully you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. If you're brand new to the channel, please subscribe for all things Lorcana. Hit the like button to show your support and we'll see you soon. Oh.